Once again, to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our ongoing study. Now, um, for, for quite a number of weeks now, we've been looking at um, the transition from Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome mm -hmm. that was represented by the statue of Nebuchadnezzar in his dream in Daniel chapter 2. And our purpose was to see how that is affecting the church today. Right. And of course it shouldn't be having any effect on the church today, but I think we, we've pretty well shown in our study that it, it indeed has. Uh, you know, I was this past weekend I was over at a church here in Central Florida and I was uh, preaching about worship. And I, I said during that time that I'm not particularly looking for revival in the church. Right. What I'm looking for, and what I believe the Lord is looking for, is reformation yes. in the church. The church needs reform. Mm. Um, reform has to do with repentance. Right? There's not, unless there's repentance, there's not going to be any reformation. There's no change. But there's a process there. The first thing is you have to recognize there's a problem. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do here, is recognize what the problem is. Because if you don't recognize the problem, you'll never deal with it. Right. All right? And then you have to have remorse. When you recognize something and you see that it's not what lines up with the Word of God, we need remorse. We can't just accept it. Mm -hmm. All right, And that leads to repentance. Repentance is to change our minds and start doing it differently. Right. If, we're, if we see that we are doing something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, we need to change. And that is indeed reformation. That's reforming. Right. And that's true revival. Okay? Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me. So in this program today, um, last week we looked at misdirect, mixed, Mist. misdirected worship going on yes. in the, and it stemmed from Babylon, as I say. Mm -hmm. What we're going to look at in this program is relics and rituals mm -hmm. and the quest for power. <laughs> Ta -da. But before we do that, once again, Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Jesus. Oh Lord, we just thank you for you coming to earth and showing you, showing us the way things ought to be it, by your word and also for the cross. And just put it in a way that we can understand it tonight and proclaim it. Amen. Amen. Put a guard over my mouth, Lord. Understanding. Okay. Uh, since I said I want to talk about power, right? And I'm going to talk about how the world and most religion seeks power through through relics and rituals. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind that the very last thing, the very last thing that Jesus said while he was here on earth, he said to his apostles just before he ascended into heaven, was to command them not to leave Jerusalem until they received power. Yes. The church cannot operate without power. That's right. Now, I'm going to say basically, power is about control. If you have power over something, you have control over something. Yes. Do you want to know an alternative I'm definition? not sure I do or not, but go ahead, we'll see. I'll let you know when you say it. <laughs> power is the ability to do work. All right, how about this? Because this would be a dictionary definition. Okay. Power is the ability to act or the capability of doing or accomplishing something. Yeah. Okay? So, yeah, that's basically the same thing. It also, in the dictionary, says it is the possession of control or command over others. When you have power, you have authority yes. over them, yes. right? Power, now, if you take notes, write this one down, mm -hmm. because power belongs to the Almighty. Amen. It belongs to Him. I mean, that's why Jesus made that clear when he was teaching the, his disciples how they should pray. Yes. He said, pray in this way, right? I'm sure you've heard this before. For thine, speaking to the Father, 
right? To the yes, Father. Yes. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Right? Matthew 6.13. Mm -hmm. The power belongs to God. I want to, I'm going to just read a couple of verses here just to, we're going to start putting this in context. One of the first places that God so magnificently displayed his power was when he, through his instrument of Moses, delivered his people out of bondage in Egypt, right? Brought them through the, the, the parted Red Sea into the, into the wilderness and then down into the promised land. That was a display of power, okay? okay? Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of this place. That's Exodus 13.3. God delivered his people by a powerful hand. That's exactly what the word says. And I want you to note those words, power and hand, Go together well and over and over and over in Scripture. Now, the, the Hebrew word that's translated hand there is Yod. Okay? And that is specifically an open hand. Okay? Nothing to hide. Well, it's, it's more than that. But that. That's true. You're not hiding anything in it. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Mm. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John 27 through 29. Let me get, regardless of what situation you find yourself in, what circumstances you're, you're in, I will always tell you that, that whatever the situation is, God has the situation well in hand. Yes. Because he has control. He has power. He is all authority, right? So now we're going to get back and start looking at the, this transition through, as I said, from, from Babylon to Rome. In the end of the Bible, as we get into Revelation, an angel came down from heaven and cried out with a mighty voice, voice Fallen, fallen is mm -hmm. Babylon the Great. Yes. Babylon, and that's not just Babylon, it is that series of, it's the kingdom of the world, right? It has a destiny. And the destiny is not good. Because it's already been spoken, it is already an accomplished fact. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. And then it goes on to say, and I'm reading from Revelation 18, 23. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because, listen to this now, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Uh -huh. The sorcery that empowered the theology of Babylon was performed by the pagan priests, the magicians. Well, the magi. Yes. That's what they were. The, the Greek word magos, that's... that's which means, literally, one of the learned priests, one of the members of the learned, learned priesthood. So, our word magician comes from the priesthood of Babylon, who were the Magi. Okay? The three wise men that went to Jesus, they had been, you know, it says that they came from the east. They had been priests. But, praise God, uh, the Lord apparently spoke to them and drew them down, right? The Greek word that is used to name the priest sorcerers of Babylon is applied to Simon the Magician in Acts chapter 8, right? right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk That's about right. him, yeah. and Elimus, the Jewish false prophet and magician in Acts 13. Yeah. Okay? Now, let's go back to Moses and the Pharaoh for a moment. In Exodus chapter 7, it says this, So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
magic is as old as sin. Yes. Magic is the imitation of power. Yes. Okay? Yes. Magic is not power. It is the imitation of, it is the counterfeit of God's power. Smoke and mirrors. Let me go back. I mentioned Simon, right? In Acts chapter 8. It says in Acts chapter 8, Now there was an, a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they, this guy practicing magic, they took that as the power of God. Magic has always had a spiritual component. All right? Yes. Magic's been around for a long time. Uh, what is magic based on? It's based on de Slide of hand. It's well, based on deception. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more than more than just deception. Okay, deception, distraction. These are the things mm -hmm. that it has to have. Deception and distraction. That sounds like Satan. Well, well it, it is Satan. That's the uh, source. He's the source of it. He's the great counterfeit. You know, he is he is the great counter. He in act in Isaiah chapter 14, 14, he says, I will make myself like the most high God. If God is the source of all authority and power, okay, and Satan wants to make himself like that, he has no power. Satan has been disarmed. You need to understand that. It says that in uh, Colossians. So he doesn't have power. He's been disarmed. That's right. So magic is that imitation. It's always sleight of hand. I, you know, I said it's about that power open hand. hand. Right. But now with ma magicians, it's about it's sleight of hand. All right. And they do that by smoke and mirrors, by distraction. They get you looking one way while they're doing something else, right? And it is, it's fascinating because there's no doubt about the fact that magic has the appearance of great power. And it, it can astonish you. I mean, I, I've taken note of the fact that here recently on television, there are dozens and dozens of shows about magic, okay? But it's not new, you know. I'm taking it back, it goes back to, to Babylon, it goes back to before, it goes back to Egypt. Um, it, it's always been around. You know, I, I think of people like uh, Eric Weiss. You know Eric Weiss? Yes. No. The great Houdini? Yeah. Okay. Everybody knows him as Houdini. His, act, his real name um, was Eric Weiss. He was Jewish. His father was a rabbi. He was very much into the occult and into, into. I mean, there was a spiritual component. And nobody could figure out how he did the things he did. And it looks like he has this incredible power. But it's all trickery. It's all trickery. Okay? Remember what Jesus said, speaking of the end times, when they came, you know, and this is in Matthew 24, and they said, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the days, right? And, and Jesus warned them, saying, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, 24. So do you think that's, that's an incredible satanic power? Well, if the word of God is true, and trust me it is, he's been disarmed. He has no real power. It's magic. Trickle. It is sleight of hand. It's deceit. It's, okay? That's why it says we're not to lean on our, on our own understanding. Your senses, my senses, can easily be deceived. It's one of the, I've actually taken time to watch a couple of these shows on television about how easily your brain can be deceived. Yes. And it's fascinating. I mean, people know that it's coming and still so can't, can't deal with it. Um, people see things differently. You know. I flew as a crewman in the United States Navy, and one of the things that we were trained about was vertigo. Mm. And that's why if you fly at all, you have to understand that you must trust your instruments because your your senses can be so fouled up. Right. Um, that I, experiment you used to do. I used to do an experiment when I did Bible studies yeah. way back in, in the late 70s in, in New York 
we had a little stool that spun around, right? And you put somebody on it, and you close their eyes, and you spin them around a little bit, and you ask them which direction are you going, and they'll immediately tell you the correct direction. And then, you know, if they keep their eyes closed and you stop them and say, okay, what direction are you going now? And they will tell you, well, I'm going the other way. Well, they're not going anyway at that point. They're stopped dead. But it, it is simply a matter of physics. You see, you, you know movement by the fluid in your ear canal. And when you start spinning one way, that fluid flows and does something in your ear that sends a signal to your brain saying you're going in that direction. But when you stop that fluid starts to go back and it sends a signal to your brain saying you're going the other way even though you're not moving. I had a pilot, when I had a, an advertising agency, I've had advertising agencies and we had a client in the Bahamas and I had a pilot who did some work for us and had him fly me and my art director over to the Bahamas to spend time with a client over there. And on the way back, I decided this guy would not be my pilot anymore. Because first of all, we're coming in, we're supposed to check in at West Palm Beach, the International Airport. You have to clear customs when you come back in. And as we're flying in, uh, I'm sitting in the, in the, I'm sitting in the right seat, he's in the left seat. And he, the, the tower comes on and says, you know, turn left 90 and, for approach. And he turns right 90. And I said to him, I'm not going to mention his name, I said to him, you know, the tower told you to go the other way. Well, he was looking out his window at Lantana Airport, and he thought that that's what the, the tower was referring to. So he made a decision on his own that, that the tower made a mistake and he's going in the wrong direction. Because he was relying on his sight. He was relying on his understanding of what he was seeing. Then we got in the plane and headed from West Palm to Orlando, and along the way we encountered some bad weather, and there was zero visibility. And so again, I got you know he's sitting here in the left, and I'm sitting in the right. And I'm just kind of relaxing, nothing to see. And I look down at the instrument panel, and we are in a nice dive, in a wrong attitude. Altitude. Attitude. Attitude. In other words, yeah, we're losing altitude oh. and in a wrong attitude. Gotcha. And you couldn't feel that. So I said to him again, I said, you know, are you aware of the fact that we are headed for the ground? And he wasn't, because it just doesn't register with your senses. So you have to keep alert. Yes. It's kind of like the boiling frog. There's yeah. so, but, but this is where you really, you know, we did a biobite not long ago uh, called uh, Optical Illusions. Yes. yes. And it is so fascinating how easily we can be deceived. This is why, you know what, the instrument panel that God has given us is his word. Yes. That's always correct. So this is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. To be led by the Word of God, a, a lamp and a light that, you know, that is there to guide us. So, but we have to train ourselves. It is the natural man that is always looking to operate by what he sees, what he feels, by your senses. Okay? Magic almost always involves instruments and incantations, deceit, and above all, deception. Just not only deception, but distraction. Okay. Power lies in God's hand, as I said, but with the ultimate counterfeit, it's always sleight of hand. So I want to talk about those rec relics, rituals, pilgrimages, and incantations. Because these are the magic... You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, the magician. He's got, he's got his little magic wand, and he's got his top hat, yes. and he, he waves it over the top hat and says, abracadabra, and then pulls a rabbit out. Yeah. Right? So he's got the instruments, he's got the tools, yes. and he's got the incantations, that's the sayings that go to make things happen. Well, relics are one of the tools of the false magic. Now, relics, you know what relics are? It's the bones of the saints. Now, I'm, I'm talking about... It is an item, it's a physical item. It's a physical item, and in Christianity, it's something that, well, I'm saying Christianity, in religion, it's always had some yes. spiritual power associated with it, okay? That's what relics do. I want to read to you from the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia. The veneration of relics, in fact, is to some extent a primitive instinct 
and it is associated with many other religious systems besides that of Christianity. Well, that's one way of saying every pagan religion that's ever existed has had these relics that are some kind of something, some physical thing that has power associated with it. <clears throat> I have mentioned a couple of times in our studies that I think one of the greatest turning points of Christianity was in the time of Constantine, right? When he made Christianity successful. But his mother, Helena, I, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but I got to tell you, she, she went, Constantine sent her to Jerusalem. When she came back, she had found where Christ had been buried, where he had been crucified, where he had been born, and started building these churches. Not, not church, a gathering of believers, but these buildings and shrines. So she came back and said that she had found the true cross. I'm just going to say flatly that if these crosses, these wooden instruments of, of execution that the Romans used, if you think that the Christians venerated these things and said, oh, we better keep that cross, you got to be nuts. It was a horror. The horror of the cross. They were not into relics. They were not. We talked about this last week when we were talking about worship. Yes. They weren't into any form of idolatry. They were not into physical things that were the manifestation, right? When I was a teenager, as I said, I flew in the Navy. I promise you, my mother wouldn't let me go out. She had candles. She had her little altar set up in the house. You know, this is... And she had candles lit all the time that I was flying in the places I was flying back in the 60s. She wouldn't let me drive a car when I first started driving without my St. Christopher, the little statue, the little plastic statue or something. Hang on. That's superstition is what it is. It is simply superstition. Okay? The church, and again, I mentioned this in our last program last week, like John Calvin. He came out so so greatly against this kind of idolatry in the church. So as a result of that, as a result of Martin Luther and Swingley and, and John Calvin, the Catholic Church called a general council, called the Council of Trent. Now the Council of Trent is one of the most important gatherings of the Catholic Church in history, in history. It was in the mid-1500s. The mid they, they started in 1545 and went on until 1563. That was a reaction to the Protestant Reformation. Now, one of the things that they determined in that council, and this is you know, one of the things that became the official dogmatic teaching of the Catholic Church, was that they instructed bishops and pastors, and this is a quote, to instruct their flocks that the holy bodies of holy martyrs and others now living with Christ, meaning dead, are to be venerated by the faithful. For through these, many benefits are bestowed by God on men. In other words, they're instructing all Catholics to be taught that the bodies, you know, these relics, a bone, a finger bone of this saint, or uh, the blood of this saint, or whatever, that God uses them to bring benefits to mankind. Can you show me that anywhere in Scripture, that that's his plan? And the council went on to say, and this is, I'm still quoting, that they who affirm that veneration and honor are not due to the relics of the saints, or that these and other sacred monuments are uselessly honored by the faithful, and that the places dedicated to the memories of the saints are in vain visited with the view of obtaining their aid, that's what I'm doing right now, right, mm -hmm. is uh, they're to be wholly condemned. Okay, This is serious to them. Now, so that's your relics. And people travel, they do pilgrimages. They go all over the world to get to these relics. And rituals. A ritual is a prescribed or established rite, a ceremony or a proceeding. In other words, well, the problem with that is, let me just give you a couple of examples. Jesus heals the blind. Hallelujah. He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee, didn't he? Yes, he did. So in John chapter 9, Jesus encounters a man born blind. He spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it on the guy's eyes, and says, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. 
All right, so now we know how blindness is healed. No. In that case. In Mark chapter 8, he spit on somebody's eyes, touched him, and the guy was healed. In Mark chapter 10, with simply a proclamation about the man's faith, the man was healed. In other words, you can't box him in. No. He will, ways, yes. not our ways. He will always bless, but it's not. You can't. You can't say, okay, this is how he does it. No. Jesus, when when he was with his his disciples, and they were going across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm arose. Right. Yeah. Jesus, after rebuking them for their little faith, gets up and and he oh, speaks to the storm, and tells the storm to be calm, mm -hmm. peace, be still, right? Well, in Acts chapter 27, when Paul is being transported to Rome, a monstrous storm arises on the ship that Paul, you know, so taking this ship that Paul is on. And once again, God speaks and brings peace. But to the people. But to, to the, the people, yeah. not to the storm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this concept of, of rituals where you repeat the same thing over and over and over, that's, that's just not right. And the pilgrimages, oh my goodness. Should I mention the Lourdes in, in France, or Fatima in Portugal, or Medjugorje in Bosnia Herzegovina? Herzegovina. How far do you have to go to get in touch with God? Psalm 119, 151 says, You are near, O Lord, and your commandments are truth. Psalm 145, eight, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You know, Paul said in Athens that he, God, is not far from each one of us. How far do you have to go? From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. How far do you have to go? Maybe no farther than your knees. Just call upon Just go to your knees. Call upon his name. Well, it, it's, it's ever so true. I mean, you know, you see people going here and there. Try, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to connect with the power of right. God. They go to these shrines, to these places, because they want to connect with the power of God. Well, where is the power of God? If you are a believer, I can tell you where the power of God is. It's right here. That's right. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is the power. You don't have to travel any place. i just share one quick thing, because we're running out of time again. I was in a church in, in uh, California years ago. And in the midst of the service, the, the, the pastor, a friend of mine, called this woman up to sing a special song. She got up and she sang a Bette Midler song from a distance. Mm. And afterwards, I went up to him and I said, I don't understand why you had her sing that song, because it's absolutely scripturally untrue. Mm. God is watching, but not from a distance. Yes. He is very near. He's yes. never present help. Yes. We need to understand that the power of God for a believer resides inside of you. Amen. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. I, I understand what a placebo effect is, and sometimes people get touched by God because God is merciful and yes, gracious. He is. But I promise you, they're not, getting, they're not getting touched by God because they traveled to go to this place where there's a shrine or this. He's there and ever present. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, this, we have more to discuss about this topic, but we are just out of time. Again. So, out of, once again, yeah, the time goes so quickly. Very quickly. By the way, time is going quickly. Yes. So be on your guard. Yes. Redeem the time, for the end is near. And I don't know how exactly how near it is, but I'm going to pray even so, come Lord Jesus. Because Father, it is our great desire to be with you. Yes. Lord, for that day when we're all gathered, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. So Father, we just praise you and thank you and look forward to being with you there in heaven. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. Till next time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the and best for a world of lost sinners.